Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and we are on the final legs of our epic interplanetary voyage to the planet of Kerbin as part of simulating interplanetary journeys. Now, um, some of you have pointed out that uh, this lawn launcher that uh, took off from the planet is not going to be able to make the return trip because it doesn't have enough fuel. And of course, those people never watched the other videos because they didn't realize what the plan was. The plan was we are going to rendezvous with the interplanetary transfer vehicle and that will carry everyone home. And yes, the people that have been watching will notice that I have sneakily removed two crew from the interplanetary transfer vehicle. So yeah, we've got to take these guys in this low orbit, which is roughly 102 kilometers high, and we have to transfer it up to the higher orbit. And I've done this before, but I really want to be very specific about the math because I keep on getting asked questions. So what we need to do is look at the relative orbital periods. Now, the per orbital period is calculated by 4 pi times gm, then you, then you multiply that by uh, the semi-major axis to the power 3, and then you take the square root of that whole thing. But for relative periods, the whole 4 pi gm thing, that doesn't matter because you're just looking at the relative values. What you do is if you have one orbit at one altitude, you can get a number that represents its period by taking its uh, orbital radius and raising it to the power three, and then uh, taking the square root of that, and that gives you the power two. And when you throw all this through, and I'm gonna skip over this for now, it comes out that you need to uh, fire at uh, roughly 43.7 degrees. So to do this, I had a protractor which I laid across the screen. Uh, it actually, with this one, you could have probably got away with uh, taking a piece of paper and folding a corner in half to get 45 degrees. But, you know, that this is what we're doing and we'll see how well it works. So we're firing into our transfer orbit and you'll notice that the transfer orbit, by definition, will have to have a peri key at the first lower orbit and an apple key at the second higher orbit. And this, you, what we're interested in is calculating the relative period of this elliptical orbit with respect to the period of the target orbit. So the start orbit was uh, roughly 100, well, it was 702 kilometers. The final orbit is uh, 1062, and that roughly gives us a, a transfer orbit semi-major axis of uh, 882. What you do is you take the average of the two of these. The target orbit is, of course, 1062. So what you do is you divide 882 by 1062, and then you raise, you cube that. So you use the little cube button on the Windows uh, calculator in scientific mode. Then you take the square root of that. And what does that tell you? It says, it gives you the number of 0.757. This means that for every complete revolution the lower orbit performs, the higher orbit will only uh, go around 75.7% of its orbit. So what we're going to do is one half orbit going from the perikee to apokee, and that will be 180 degrees. So if we multiply 180 degrees by 0.757, we get 136.2. So that's how many, uh, how far the upper orbit will travel. But what we're actually interested in is the difference between 180 and 136.2, and that is 43.8 degrees. So that is how close we have to be to the upper orbit before we start our burn. And as you can see, that has got us pretty darn close when we look at this orbit from above. Even using the rather poor uh, quality estimation techniques that are to measure angles. Oh, I, I also there are uh, third-party software applications that let you overlay, you know, angular measurements on the screen. Those are a nice thing until a uh, Kerbal Space Program gets them. So anyway, yeah, I'm just circularizing my orbit. We've done this before many times. Just going to try and get myself to exactly the right uh, same distance as my target orbit. I'm a little low right now. And uh, let's see where we are. Now, can we see the other spaceship? Well, uh, it's somewhere. Out oh, there it is over there. It is 44 kilometers out. And the reason it's 44 kilometers out is because the inclinations of the two orbits are slightly different. So we need to fix that. And of course, you wait... When you're doing rendezvous burns, you always do your inclination corrections in the higher altitude orbit 
because then you need less fuel to do this. So I'm just going to continue uh, correcting. And yeah, so we see that right now the two orbits are starting to uh, are are heading towards the same node. They're going to come close together where those two orbit lines cross. And that is the moment where we want to burn to correct our motion. Now you can see that we're moving from left to right. And uh, the North Pole is at the top of the screen. So when we arrive at this node, we want to burn north to get our, our relative velocities to, to match. And once we've done that, it will be just a case of uh, fine-tuning the, the motion and uh, EVAing across. So I think, you know, I've been trying to answer as many of the, the actual mathematical requirements for um, rendezvous in this video, because that really, you know, a lot of people seem to get very uh, concerned when I start coming out with mathematics, but it really is absolutely trivial. And, you know, with a bit of practice, you can figure it out yourself or use one of the third party calculators out there. There's no reason, um, you know, there's, no, there's nothing stopping you from learning this. Um, so, yeah, we're just burning upward, burning north. And that is the orbits getting matched. And you can see that uh, the other spacecraft has started to pull ahead a little. I'll need to do some correction there. Uh, yeah, it looks like my orbit is a little higher than theirs, so I'm traveling more slowly, so I need to do some retro burns. But I'm now within 12 kilometers. Um, this, sh and, and yeah, conveniently, the burn I need to do is actually backwards towards them. <laughs> there we go. And so again, now the task is to, to fine tune everything, get in close and then EVA across. And of course, we're going to just time accelerate this whole thing because nobody wants to watch this again in great detail. Well, so while old me flies this, uh, let's talk about a few other things. So 0.17 must be getting closer because they're on a blog post from a couple of days ago. Nova Salisco finally uh, revealed the names for all the new planets. The, the new planets are going to be Moho, Eve, Duna, J and Jewel. And they will all have a series of moons. Now, the lava planet is going to be close in. That's, that's Moho. That's going to be really close to the sun. It will probably be the hardest to get to simply because you need the most delta V and because it won't have an atmosphere for aerobraking. Eve, well, uh, Eve is the next one out. It's going to be something like Venus, but... According to uh, some more posts, it's going to have a mass roughly 50% higher than Kerbin. Therefore, its surface gravity is going to be higher. And the atmosphere is going to be like five times the atmospheric pressure and density on Kerbin, which means practically anything that you've designed up to this point capable of taking off Kerbin probably can't get off this planet. Um, I'm not sure whether uh, turbo jets will actually work. If they don't work, then it will be a genuine challenge to get people off the surface off of EVE. Uh, that making EVE one of the hardest and most inhospitable planets in the game uh, serves as something of a metaphor for EVE Online, perhaps. So yeah, it'll have a small captured moon uh, called Gilly. Now, outside the Kerbin orbit, you're going to have Duna, which is uh, essentially a, a Martian analog, and it will have a desert planet moon. Uh, we're not sure w what the exact size of that is, but it's going to be called Ike. Then the one that I'm most interested in is a gas giant of Joule. Uh, that's apparently a giant green world. You won't be able to land on it. The atmosphere will probably be even thicker than Eve, and no doubt the surface will kill you if you fall into it. It will have four moons. The first will be an ocean moon called Lathe. The second will be an ice moon called Val. The third will be a rocky moon called Tylo. And furthest out, there will be a small uh, moon called Bop, which will be a rocky captured asteroid, I guess. Apparently, that will be in an eccentric orbit based on the, um, the photos that have come out at this time. Now, I'm guessing that since the, the ocean moon has liquid water on it, they're going to come up with some... Uh, reasoning that this is equivalent to Io in that the tidal forces of the moons interacting is going to generate a tidal heat inside that planet and keep it liquid. So uh, I would actually hazard a guess that the relative distances of the ocean, ice and rocky moons will probably form a, a resonant um, trio of uh, one to two to four, just like the real uh, Jovian moon system. 
But of course, this is all speculation at this time and everything could change. There are rumors that test versions are coming, but uh, I cannot confirm or deny those myself. The developers have also introduced us to new two Kermans. We have Eugene Kerman, who will be the guy in Mission Control, and there will be Werner von Kerman, who is a rocket head rocket scientist, I imagine, for the Kerbal Space Program. And of course, in the real world, I was saddened to hear that a real astronaut, Neil Armstrong, finally left us for uh, the final journey wherever he is going. As a fan of British comedy, I still think of him as the first singer-songwriter on the moon. And so yeah, we have got one astronaut home and Jebediah is making the final journey. We have, um, dis- we are going to basically abandon this capsule in orbit. Uh, maybe at some point it will be useful as a fuel stop for some uh, EVA astronaut. But uh, really, we're just going to leave it up there because the there's no way to put it back into the atmosphere safely. So yeah, Jeb coming in. The spacecraft is spinning a bit, so let's... Uh, Go back inside and tell it to stabilize a little. It's kind of cool watching Jeb float around the outside there. And uh, you see that we still have a couple of uh, space probes attached. And we have the Munner lander still attached on the top. After we get all three crew in this vessel, we will be using its ample fuel reserves to visit both moons and uh, put down astronauts on the surface for more science so that we get... You know, not one landing, but three landings out of this mission setup. Three landing from two rockets makes a, makes for a better value for money, I think, in the end. And that's us. We are now ready to voyage onwards and ultimately homewards. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.